Hi, my name is Mikey Smith. I'm the Student Ministry Director here at Trailside. Thanks for stopping by. We hope that by the end of this message, you feel encouraged, that you feel closer to Christ than you have ever did before, and that through its message, you will want to be more like Jesus every single day. Enjoy the message, and thanks for stopping by. Well, good morning, church. How we doing? All right, let me try that again. Good morning, church. Okay, we got some life. That's good. Yeah. I don't know why my voice went that high, but it did. So, hey, let me pray for us, and we'll get right into it. Jesus, thank you so much. Uh, God, thank you for uh, the gift of the beautiful snow that you gave us yesterday, and uh, hopefully that that allowed us to spend time and um, reminisce and consider all the good that you are and that you give us um, every day and all the time how you take care of us and that you bless us. And um, although snow sometimes can not be a blessing, uh, thank you that it was beautiful yesterday and that I got to enjoy it with my family. And uh, pray that you would be with us this morning. God, that you would um, inhabit your word, that it would be uh, your word that's spoken. Therefore, it would uh, mess up our hearts. It would, it would show us uh, what it is in us that needs to be removed and made new. And God, that you would uh, do what you do and that you would move in that and that you would honor that and that you would make us more like you as we walk out of here than we were when we came in. Father, you're good. We love you. We thank you. Thank you for salvation, for truth, and for hope. And as in your name we pray, amen. amen. Well, church, we're going to be in a book that um, hopefully you've read before, but if you haven't, that's okay. Uh, and it's called Ecclesiastes. It's actually in the wisdom literature, so it's right around Psalms and Proverbs. So if you have a Bible, uh, if you basically open up right at halfway of your Bible, you'll probably land on Psalms or Proverbs, and it's just a little bit before that. It's the best way I can tell you. Um, if you are new here, if it's your first time and uh, you want to know how to follow along with us, we don't have little handouts um, because those are annoying and I just don't want to clean them up every week. But on the, I think it's the orange side of that card on your seat, you can download our app. If you just take a picture of it, it'll send you right to the link. You can download the app. It doesn't take up much space, but everybody's phone is like 150 gazillion bytes. Um, but uh, you can go in there, download it, and then the bottom right section is notes. You click notes, you can follow along. There's even little fill in the blanks. Just if you're a button pusher and want to see things pop, uh, you can do that as well. So love to encourage you in that. Um, so church, I love you. It, it, it's a joy to, to lead this church and to be a part of what's happened the last couple years. And don't worry, we're still happening. Um, but I wanted you to know that, that I, I love you and I, and I care for you. Um, it is an honor to be your pastor. Uh, and so with that, we're going to talk about a little bit in this Better Together series about what we want to accomplish over the next few months um, when it comes to terms of one of our three statements of living unified. This whole, this whole series, Better Together, is about how we are better together with Jesus and we're better together with the Word and we're better together with each other. And we're going to culminate this in a marriage retreat at the end of the month. Um, if you're not signed up for that, please do. If you are married, I want to encourage you. Uh, this is a moment for you to get away and to put everything to the side and reconnect. Um, if you're not married, I said last week you have three. You got two weeks now. So um, time is pressing. Uh, but we'll talk more about that here in a little while. Um, but we're going to talk about two things today. The first is that we're going to be pressing in towards community at our church. Uh, put plainly, you are not as tough as you think you are. Can I just say that? I know that probably hurts. Some of you are wanting to fight right now, and you're like, I'll show you how tough we are because we're in TR, and I get it. But, but you're, you're not as strong as you think you are alone. But you are 10 times stronger than you realize you are together. Because what we should be doing as a church is we should be sharing the burdens of each other together. We, we are... When we are united and together and fighting for each other, there is nothing that will overcome this church. Nothing. There's, there's nothing that will overcome you. It might feel like you are falling apart and being torn bit by bit, but the reality is when you are in community and you have people and you're investing in those people, that you are stronger than you ever realized. You have the ability to carry more than you have ever comprehended and understood. And if you don't believe me, we have multiple stories of the, in this church already of people who have found that to be true. And my encouragement to you today as we dive into Ecclesiastes 4, as we're going to be starting in verse 9, as we dive into this today, and the words will be on the screen, that I hope that you understand that that is our push. What we as pastors, 
feel led to show you in the vision and encourage you to walk in is to walk in community with people. That's, that's my selling point today. That's what I want you to walk out of here with. In fact, I, I would say this, that life is, is only successfully lived when it's done in relationship, when it's done in community. That's the only way to successfully live life. There's a, I, I, I remember growing up, I heard this a lot, and maybe that's why I'm the way I am. But I always heard that nobody wants to die alone. That was my biggest fear as a kid, right? Do you guys ever remember having terrible fears that like, didn't make sense and don't make sense as an adult, but when you're a kid, they just terrify you? Anybody had those moments? Maybe some of you are adults and you're like, I still am terrified of things like clowns. I get that. Yeah, I, I fully blame my uh, fear of everything on this show called Unsolved Mysteries. <laughs> Anybody remember that? Yeah. I would come down like 8 o'clock at night, 8.30. My parents are sitting there watching it, and I'll never forget. This is how, how the depth of my effect, Mom. My mom's here, as usual, so she's going to hear something truth today. Um, I remember, it, was, it might be like 9 or 9.30, right? That show's on a little later. I remember walking downstairs, and um, I kind of peer on the edge because the way our house was built, you could see into the TV room until they moved it. And so my brother and I would sit on the stairs and like kind of like wrench our necks around and watch TV. It didn't matter what mom and dad were watching, right? Sometimes you're just like, I'm doing what I want. Check me out, being tough on the steps, craning my neck around, because you can do that when you're nine. Um, but I remember one time I turned my neck around the stairs and I just sat there and held the bars and like looked over and they were watching Unsolved Mysteries. And it was this story about a house in South Carolina, <laughs> which when you're nine, you don't know where in South Carolina other places are. It could be in your back porch. It could be six hours away. But it was in South Carolina, right? And these people were telling the story about this really nice and really mean ghost of a Confederate soldier that would go through their house and talk to them. And I was like, I'm not going to bed. I'm not, I'm not going back up the steps. And I, remember, I can like see in my mind's eye this picture of this room. It has a railing, which was terrifying because I was in front of one. And it dropped down a step, all wood floors, and it was this ghostly Confederate soldier who like would just walk across. And he looked dead at the camera and like nodded. And you're like, okay, well, I, I have chills right now. I'm just going to be honest with you. My theology on ghosts have changed, but I'm freaking out right now as I'm telling this story. Everything, everything bad is happening in me right now. You're seeing a man unfold. And then to add to it, the, the guy that, that is on the show has the scariest voice of all time. It's this deep grovelly. And then the soldier came and killed little kids on the steps, right? And that's, that's <laughs> what I remember about it. Scary. Scary, but... All that to say. The other thing I remember as a kid is, is being told that nobody won die alone. In that moment where I thought I was going to die alone on the steps, that's always stuck with me. Because you weren't made to live alone. You, you weren't made to live just kind of putting walls up and hoping that you'll be tough enough or that you can get by or that you don't have to share vulnerability because if someone finds out the true you, then maybe they actually won't love you or like you anymore. You don't have to do that. The, the beauty of Christian community and relationship is that we are called and given and made and formed to share in each other's burdens, to pick each other up and to walk with each other. In fact, in Genesis 1, in the beginning of Scripture, when this entire love story starts, as God is forming man, he says something really incredible in verse 26. He says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. This is the first evidence we have of a trinity. It's God speaking to God and to God and saying, us together, let us make mankind. Let him make us in our image, in our likeness. See, the Godhead exists in relationship. The, the very form of how you were built, how you were woven together by God was formed in relationship, was given to you and put in you by people in relationship. And, and the, the cool thing about this is that we read and that maybe, maybe you haven't thought of, I hadn't really in this fashion until recently, 
But when, when the Godhead, when the Trinity is, is creating man together, they're not just saying, okay, you use your superpowers and I'll use a little bit of mine. That's not how that works. They're actually sharing in the burden of creation together. Isn't that something? Like the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are sharing in their burden together in building creation, in forming you and I. Uh, that messed me up a little bit. First of all, because I just my brain's not that big. I'm very simple. But secondly, because the, the relationship that comes, that is, that is displayed by the Godhead in creating you, is so much deeper than just three roles kind of all doing their own thing and out pops man. And, and church, we too are formed to exist with that dynamic in our lives. You were formed and made to have relationship. You, you were formed and made in, in the, the innermost parts of your weaving together, built into you to do life with people. Some of you are like, I know, I've been waiting for her to walk up for the last 10 years, but she ain't here yet. I'm not, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying those kind of relationships. I'm saying relationship with people, intimacy with people, togetherness. That's what you were formed as. In fact, in Genesis 2, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helpmate suitable for him. In Proverbs 27, it says, so as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. That's the favorite verse of every men's ministry of every church in America, right? <laughs> every single one of them. It's like a sword and iron sharpens iron. You're like, that's a men's ministry. I'm going to go, right? And then some of you ladies who are real tough are like, I want to go to the sword sharpening ministry. <laughs> it's okay. I promise we have a different verse for our men's ministry. But listen, if, if you and I were meant to live life apart, if we were meant to do this by ourselves, then why would God point so much toward relationship? This entire book, the entire scripture is a love story of God and his creation and pointing toward relationship. That's the entire thing of what we believe. That's the whole point of this is relationship. But you know what we do instead? We say, no, I'm going to stay over here in my safe zone. Right? Because nobody can hurt me if I have this castle wall built here. You stay over there, and we're going to do this. Like, we'll see each other in Walmart. How's your family? Great. That's the, the two questions we ask in the South, right? How are you? Which means hello. How's your family? Which means I know you have one, I think, so tell me real quick so it looks like I'm invested in you. Right? When you get to be my age, I'm 36. The ripe, old, falling apart 36, Right? Yeah, I know some of you are like, try 50. I'm with you. I'm amazed I got this far, to be honest with you. So are my parents. We're like, well, when you get my age, it's like, so how are your kids? You have kids. That's awesome. And you hear for the fifth time about their child that you already forgot about because relationship and community aren't there because intimacy isn't there. And we're like, great. Good luck with your kid who throws up every three hours. I'm pumped for you about that. I'm going to go this way and be safe. Because we weren't meant to live apart. Uh, in fact, I'm going to say something crazy, and if you need to get up and leave the church right now, I will allow five seconds for that. But everyone's going to stare at you. I'm just going to be honest with you. There it is. This half got it. Wake up. No, see, that's our quiet people saying loud people. You over there. I'm over here. I'm going to say something a little crazy. I, I think, as a believer especially, that you should invest in friendships and relationships of people who see the world differently than you do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> yeah. You should invest in relationships with people who see differently than you. Democrats and Republicans, you can exist freely together. It's amazing. You don't have to hate each other. Nobody is as dumb as you want them to be on the other side of the aisle. They're just not. Young generations and old generations, you can be with each other and invest in relationship with each other. One thing I love about my mom being at church here is I get great hugs and a kiss on the cheek every week. But 
What I also love is that my mom loves my pastors and their children and their wives really well. And I I love seeing that. I love seeing that generational, a a baby that does not belong to my mom, that doesn't belong to you. (laughs) Get handed over and loved on. And to see young fathers see their child with a grandmother all together, it's a beautiful thing. We should be investing in relationships of people that don't look and think and sound like us. I got news for you. You can't get more saved, right? You become more like Jesus, but God's not like, oh, you were level three saved. We have this for you. Congratulations. We should be investing in relationships of people who don't think like we do. That's why we have Parents Night Out. That's why we have outreach. Let's go to people who don't look, sound, and think like us, and let's tell them about Jesus. It's a very clear understanding of how the gospel should work. In fact, I have a, I have a friend who is a pastor, and he was at a huge church, living the dream. And he, the way he tells the story is he looked at his phone one day, and he realized everyone in his phone he knew knew Jesus. Everybody. And that was his last day at that church. He quit that job. He went to be a, a barmaid, basically, to literally just go and change out kegs and clean toilets, clean up after people, and he would study theology, have his Bible open, and be practicing, doing his doctoral studies. This guy with a master's degree, MDiv, do his doctoral studies at the bar in between moments of changing kegs. And people would talk to him. What you reading? And he just started telling people about Jesus. And eventually he planted a church of 350 people that grew to 2,000 people. Because the mentality was that we had to talk to people who didn't think and believe like us. And that crazy idea, you can sit next to people in church who don't think everything that you think. Is that okay with us? Are we we all right with that this morning? That's what the church should be. That's how the gospel changes lives. It's that the friction of our own lives and the freedom of the gospel hit. And at some point, they have to intermingle to where lives change. And that produces growth and change in people, and the gospel infiltrates a city that way, and that's how lives and eternities change. Not by people just deciding to be nice. It's just that's not how it works. We think about iron sharpening iron. Have you ever gotten a sharpening blade stick? I don't know what they're called. Rod? You know, I meant to bring it with me so I didn't have this awkward moment, but... We'll call it a sharpening rod. That'll be fun. Have you ever actually sharpened a knife? My first uh, knife block I got was when I got married, right? And this shows you um, how often I did stuff in the kitchen. Uh, I was taking knives out, cleaning them, and I went, shoot. I was like, what is this, Lane? Looked at my wife, and she looked at me like I was stupid, and I poked her. (laughs) It's like, it's the only knife I can use, obviously, you can poke people with. And so I learned how to sharpen knives. And you notice something when you sharpen knives. It's kind of aggressive, right? Like there's a little bit of it that feels good, but when you're actually doing it, it's kind of aggressive. You're flinging a knife around, there's sparks flying. Maybe I do that wrong. Um, <clears throat> but, no, but as believers, that's really kind of how it is. As, as a knife grinds against the rod, it, what it does is, is it, it straightens. It straightens little bends in the blade. And dull areas that have become flat and unsharp, it, it resharpens them. It, takes the, it puts the edge on so the knife can be used to function properly. <clears throat> Excuse me. And th- that's, that's what we should be doing. Consider how it sounds. Consider how it feels to have metal clanging in your hands that could pop off and cut you or whatever. That through that grinding and shearing as it removes broken edges, as soft edges are made strong and sharp again, It's a little loud, it's a little dangerous, but that's exactly what community and relationship should do. Because life has to be lived outside of ourselves. It has to be, and it happens like that, and it has to be because that's the only thing that keeps us from growing self-focused and lifeless. There's nothing as lifeless than someone who is fully focused on themselves and no one else. It's death. It's, it's walking death. That's what it is. So as we turn to Ecclesiastes 4, he's going to be answering this question. I heard a, um, reading a book recently, and a pastor who wrote it said, uh, one thing pastors really get tired of hearing 
Here it goes. One thing pastors really get tired of hearing is when people say they want to go to a different church and they said, I'm not being fed there. You know, his answer was beautiful. He said, the only two times I've seen people who need to be fed is at their birth when they're infants or at their death when they're no longer able. And I thought, woof. But it's true. Because as we live self-focused, those are the things we say. In Ecclesiastes 4, he's actually answering this very question. And Ecclesiastes was written uh, traditionally by Solomon. Um, oh, it's right here. Traditionally by Solomon, who is the wisest, richest king ever. And in the first eight verses, what's happening here is that he's actually talking about people who are greedy and selfish, living em- empty for themselves. And this is what he says in the next section. He says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his friend. But woe to him who is alone and fails, or I'm sorry, woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not yet another to lift him up. <clears throat> oh, I lost it. So sorry. No, that's everything. I'm missing notes. That's great. Anyway. Is it on the screen? I totally lost my notes. I'm so sorry. Can you put 11, 12? There we go. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Next verse. Nope. And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him, for a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Sorry about that. My apologies. So the first thing in relationship that we hear Verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. I, it's good. I got it. I figured it out. Thank you. Give it up for Dusty, everyone. Yeah. You really did it. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> Can't wait to have staff meeting later today. Let's get back. Two are better than one because they have good reward for their toil. The first thing we need to know about relationship is this, that we accomplish more together. We accomplish more together. Do you want to know why you're tired? <laughs> yeah, there's the answer. Exactly. I want to challenge you with something. I think it might be, consider this, that you might be not sharing enough of your burden with the people around you in your community or that you don't have a community. Because here's, here's what happens. Vision Vision without burden sharing always will lead you to burnout. Always. Some of you are like, well, I just didn't sleep last night. Okay, what caused you not to sleep? Well, my brain races, my anxiety. Okay, who have you talked to? Who have you prayed with? Who have you met with and said, I need help? I think my wife probably has a pretty good answer right now because our baby likes to eat in one-hour spurts between the hours of 1 a.m. and 6 (laughs) a.m. But even that... The burden's not shared enough. We're trying to do too much. And and together we accomplish vision, but but you can't do life alone because you weren't designed to do life alone. And when you get to burnout, spiritual, physical, whatever, it comes because you are carrying more than you are designed to carry. And let me share this with you too. Um, Gosh. God purposefully gives us more than we are able to carry to point us toward community in him. Can I just say that? Like adages like God gives his toughest battles to his strongest soldiers. That's stupid. Don't listen to that. (laughs) Terrible theology. God will never give you more than you can handle. It's not in the Bible. He will absolutely give you more than you can handle because he wants to point you toward community and following and trusting him because you aren't designed to handle your life alone. Church, you can't do it. And you want to walk out of here and say, well, yes, I can. I'm going to prove. Great. Fine. We'll see you in two months. Because you're not designed. You will be given more than you can handle. You absolutely will. Because American culture steals it out of you. But God created you for community with others and with him. And burnout comes from carrying more than your share of the load for too long without purpose and payoff. 
And when burnout comes, it turns into frustration. And when frustration comes, it turns into exhaustion. And then exhaustion leads you to a place where you just give up because it's not worth it anymore. And church, that's not where you need to be. That is the opposite of community. Second part, we accomplish more together is this. Together we are stronger than we are alone. Our relationship was meant to accomplish more together. We can do more things to the glory of God when we are together and united in vision and we actually have skin in the game and we go after it. We can depend on each other. We can find hope in each other. We can find vulnerability in each other because we are united in the very thing we need most, which is community. I want to read you this excerpt um, from a a book from a Navy SEAL who talked about one thing that's always blown my mind, which is Bud School. Bud School is the Navy qualifying school. Uh, there's a book called Can't Hurt Me by a guy named David or Michael Goggins, who is incredible and tougher than anyone I've ever met, um, including me, probably. I'm just, he's a Navy SEAL, an Army Ranger, and I forget what else. But, but there's one part of Bud School that's always blown my mind. There's actually two. But one is the log PT is what they call it. Log PT. And here's what happens. You get around six guys that you don't know, apart from training. And you lift up a 150-pound log. And I want to describe to you what he says. And then, uh, well, you'll see where we're going. This is what he says. A log PT for me was the most searingly painful evolution during Bud's. It has such an innocuous name for making seven shivering cold and salt-soaked Navy SEALs pick up a 150-pound log, run it over a 15-foot high sand berm, drop it in the sand, immediately pick it up and press it over their heads, run the log into the ocean, and then now carry the soaked slippery log back through the soft sand and start all over again. Sounds intense, right? And that's the easy part, he says. The physical portion of training is horrible but bearable. What makes you really hurt is that you don't know how long it's going to last. Are we almost done? Have we barely started? What's next? You run the log up and down the beach. You cross the finish line in first place, but then you get punished for cheating when you thought you ran the course the right way and you ran it the wrong way. And next time you run the log up and down the beach, come in second place and then get punished because you lost. Then you change positions on the log. The weight shifts and you feel as if you're holding the whole log yourself. And you begin asking questions. Is, is the other guy slacking? Everybody's in pain. If it's early in the training and you still have a clown in your crew, everybody starts to wonder if the clown is pulling his weight. Everyone's thinking that somebody else is slacking. Their own will deflates a little bit. The log gets heavier and then wham, the log is on the ground. The instructors pile on and you start all over again. Is that resonating with anybody so far? And you think, how many more hours of this? How many more weeks? You reach a point of exhaustion at which you seem able to express yourself only, I love this, in prayer or profanity. Most guys combine the two in a very creative way. <laughs> guys ever been there? Praying and cursing, you're like, God, I'm sorry, I don't usually use those words. I'm just so whatever, right? I promise I'm a good Christian. You bend down to pick up the log, but you and your crew are a little bit less certain. You manage to lift it over your head, but it's a struggle and a fight. And as you waste your energy and spend you, your strength, you stoke your anger. And here, one of the two things happens. A crew breaks down completely. Men start to snipe at each other, each person believing that somebody else is slacking. Or two, a crew comes together. The trainees figure out a way to slow down, breathe, lift on a clear single command, and win the next race. And two hours later in the chow hall, everybody's laughing, and a few of the guys on the log are going to be friends for the rest of their lives. Hmm. One moment in log PT, I came to a realization. He says, we were carrying the log at a low carry so that our arms extend out in front of our bodies. We collectively had the log cradled in the crook of our elbows, and my biceps and shoulders and back were burning. And I remember thinking, if these guys weren't here right now, I'd probably stop. I wouldn't believe I could go on, but these guys are keeping right on beside me, so I guess I can go on too. And it's likely that soon in your work or your coaching, your service, you're going to be part of a team too, or a community, I would say. The strength of others can make us stronger. People form even deeper bonds when they're in community together. 
when they're serving together. When serve is not quite the right word, but it's better than work. People can work with others and not feel any sense of common cause, but being in the same place, working for the same boss, and even doing the same task can breed resentment, alienation, competition, and distrust, or they can bring people together. Serving together is different. When we share a purpose with others, our work creates a shared connection. And when the work matters, we're often more able to overcome personal differences to accomplish the shared goal. It's crazy that a guy in the Navy SEALs has figured out Christian community by lifting a log. But that's what can happen. We can accomplish more when we are together. Second is this, that we need each other. We need community. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. That's what verse 10 says. Because, guys, relationships are meant to strengthen you. I don't want you to live in community and be together because it's the right Christian thing to do. It's because you need it and they make you a better version of you. And relationships do one of two things. All right, we're just going to be real for a second. They are either energy and life giving or they're energy and life draining. Right? Think about Jesus. Jesus demonstrated this. When he's going, just before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, actually as he's going, he looks at his 12 disciples and he says, hey, uh, pray for me and you three come with me. And he chooses three disciples Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, and he says, come and pray with me, for I'm about to be delivered over. But then, the missing disciple shows up. Think about this. This guy spent three years with Jesus, watching, seeing everything he did, and what he decided was he was going to trade Jesus for some silver. See, even Jesus had 12 people, and one of them still turned on him. We call those people EGRs. Extra grace required. They're lovely people. They're important. Sometimes they just need an extra little bit of love. But church, here's what we've done with community. Again, we have said, I'm going to stay here. You go over there. And we've said, people are toxic, so I'm going to cut off toxic relationships, and then I'll be happier. Here's the problem with that. We are like sponges. The more that we soak and soak and soak in, if we aren't wrung out once in a while, we'll become brittle and frail and fall apart in the hand. And what's happened in churches is we've decided that we need to just fill our sponges up and then we're going to be really smart and really well put together and present well. And we've pushed all the other people aside who maybe don't have it all together, who Jesus calls us and commands us to love. And we've said, I'm sorry, I've got too much knowledge here. I can't be bothered with that. And we're falling apart because as it dries out, it destroys the sponge that holds it and it becomes brittle and it just melts in your hand. And guys, we are watching Christianity and church culture in America become brittle and fall apart in our hands. And we're wondering what the heck is going on. It's because we have decided to love theology and not love people instead of loving theology enough to learn that we need to use it to love people, that it calls us to love people. And church has become a lot about us. That's not, it's not okay. It's not, we can't be successful. And lastly, church, relationships are designed to encourage us. So my encouragement is pray with each other. Hebrews 10, 24 says, let us consider how to stir up one another toward love and good works. Pray for each other. 2 Thessalonians 1 says says this, with this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of his calling and that by his power, he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him. Because it helps, community helps us, praying for each other helps us, being in a relationship with each other helps us accomplish and fulfill the experience and calling that God has given you. And here's the last thing it does, church. We're going to get very real here, okay? I'm just going to, we're out with that. Living in community 
and loving people who are easy and who are hard to love and praying for people who you love and who you don't makes it impossible for you to hate people. And maybe you're sitting there, you're like, well, I don't hate people. I just really strongly dislike. Okay, fill in your blank. This is the only time I'll say this. Live your truth in that moment. Okay? <laughs> it's the only time you're ever going to hear that. Because <laughs> here's the deal. It is impossible to not love someone that you pray for regularly. It's impossible. And the second is this. It's impossible to not love someone you serve regularly. That person who drives you nuts, that person who drives you crazy, pray for them. Pray for them. Serve them. In fact, if you really want to get a little passive aggressive, there's a verse in Proverbs that says, by loving and serving people who hate you, it is like pouring hot coals on top of their head. So <laughs> use that however you want, I guess. But you cannot hate people you are earnestly praying for. You cannot hate people you are earnestly and lovingly serving. It's impossible because your heart will be drawn to be, here we go, more like Jesus than you. And when your heart is more like Jesus than you, you won't hate people. You will find a way to love them so they might meet Jesus and change. But the greatest threat to a believer is isolation. The greatest thing, I'm sorry, the greatest threat that you can put in your life is to live in isolation. Isolation in community. There's no one to walk with you. You stand in the shadows. And then the story becomes, I used to go to church, but I didn't feel like I was a part. And so as you walk away, get into the corner, and watch things go by, and isolate yourself, you wonder why nobody cares. And so you just walk out the back door. Hey, Katayla. Because isolation kills community. It kills the believer. It will absolutely destroy everything when you want to not feel alone anymore. It will take it, throw it in your face, and remind you that you aren't special or important, and that will be the biggest lie you believe, but it's the quickest way to walk out the back door of a church. Or isolation and mission. This is where it's going to feel a little rough, so hang with me. Since you guys I know are like, this has been great. Listen, my goal is that when you walk out those doors, if you haven't been challenged by the gospel, you shouldn't have been here, and I shouldn't either. Isolation and mission. Putting skin in the game. Look, if you're not partaking in the lifeblood of the church, there's no way for you to feel a part of it. Because you won't experience the stressors and the joys the fulfillment and the relationship. You won't experience those things because you're not giving into what it is that makes this go by isolating yourself. It's, it's, like, it's like taking a cup of water and throwing it at a house fire and hoping it's gonna work. You've gotta have skin in the game. Listen, I want you to call this place home. I want you to invest and love it like you do your home. I want you to give. I want you to serve. It's not so we can build nice things. It's so we can have a church. It's so we can pay bills because we want people to come here and find freedom. We want parents to bring their kids here on Parents' Night Out and have the fear of walking into a church be alleviated because they're walking into free babysitting and then find people who they think, man, maybe I could come and see what this is all about. And then they hear the gospel and then their eternities are changed. And then we have stories like Marcus Jones, who I met, brought his kid here, and now his daughter's being raised in a household that will follow and know Jesus instead of whatever they were following before. Like guys, that's what community does. I don't, listen, I don't want your money. I don't want your time. 
I want you to give God what God calls you to do so that this place can be a place of hope for all the people who need to know that he loves them as well. And then we'll see the city change or we can just kind of keep on Peter and by and hope it's okay and barely survive enough to keep doing what we're doing. And if this is good enough for you, then I apologize. It's not for me. I don't, I don't want you to do that so we can actually pay our bills. I don't want you to do that so that we can afford to pay our pastors and our staff. I don't want you to, do, I want you to do that because when this, when we get that part of this, this place will become a beacon of hope where people know they don't have to play Christianity and feel good, where they can come be vulnerable, live in community and find hope in their deepest, darkest moments of fear. And where they can celebrate and feel a part of every single time we pull somebody out of the baptismal water. Which is 22 and four on the way, FYI. It's a good thing, we can clap for that, sorry. I I don't want you to serve so that we can have a ton of people walking around. I want you to serve because when you're part of the team and when you're here and you're praying with us and you're walking through this place with us, it matters to you what happens. And when this place matters to you, people's lives will change because they also want to be a part of what you're doing. And I'm going to say this and I'm sorry, but it just is what it is. I'm not sorry because I do the same thing. Why is it that we will wear jerseys and shirts and hats and car stickers to demonstrate our part of a team in sports, but we have fear about having a team being a part of here. And y'all, listen, I have a Browns helmet in my office. If you're gonna hit yourself to success, don't choose the Browns. Yeah. But here's what community does. It binds you together to walk through adversity. And that's why we wear emblems on our polo shirts when we have stickers on our car. So here's my encouragement to you this morning. Wear the brand of Jesus too. Let it matter as much. Because the last thing is this, isolation in relationship. When we don't have anyone to speak life or conviction into, you will grow morally weak and tired too. And you'll be like that sponge that falls apart. Listen, muscles you never use do what? They atrophy. They dry out. They fall apart. They become weak. And if you're not using your muscles, if you're not in community and serving, if you're not doing the things to bring alleviation to the church body and to wear that part of yourself out so people would know Jesus, if that isn't there, you are becoming spiritually, you're diving into spiritual atrophy and moral atrophy. And Jesus doesn't care about following the rules. He cares that you love him really well. And what happens when we go to the gym for the first time in a long time is that the muscle hasn't been utilized and so it gets really sore, which is lactic acid coming into your body and filling in the parts of your fibers that literally you've broken because that's what you do when you work out. You break the fibers of your muscle. And so your body recoups and grows and it hurts and it's sore and it's uncomfortable. But guys, listen, that has to happen in community too. It's going to be hard for you to dive into community. It's going to stress you. It's going to pull you and break you down in ways you probably have not been broken down. But eventually when you go to the gym long enough and your muscles are built back up, you have the strength to do things you never thought possible. And it cleans up how you look, how you feel, the other muscles in your body how they work and it brings life and eventually you're not sore anymore this is why community matters church this is why we talk so much about diving in and if you call this place home your pastor your leadership your pastors are calling on you to dive in now stop Stop diving into spiritual atrophy. You need community. You need to be in community. You need to walk with other people. You need to serve. You need to give. Uh, Look, we're a new place. Pastor Sean is not apologizing for that anymore. I apologize for two years about asking you to give and be a part of this church. I'm done, done asking. I'm done being nervous. I don't have time for that. The city's growing. People, we have 68 new homes being sold every month in this city in our zip code, 68. 
You know what that second two in the whole state of South Carolina? Simpsonville. That's it. And Greenville City. It's a third, I guess. Sorry. We don't have time to waste anymore. 68 new families are coming into this town every day, every month, rather. Some of them know Jesus, some of them don't, but I promise all of them need a place to belong, and this can be a place for them. So dive in. We're starting a new men's breakfast. Then we're going to go play golf, and if you don't like golf, you can go do other stuff. I don't know. Bowl. I don't know. Whatever you want to do. I like golf. We're starting a women's ministry. We have a women's group on Wednesday. Wednesday night, it meets here. We'd love for you to come. My mom leads it, so it's nice. We have multiple hobby groups. We're opening our new home groups. Um, Softball, if you love softball, we're gonna play softball again because I love softball. And one last time, I'm gonna stress this, and then we're actually for real done. We have a marriage retreat. Husbands, invest in your marriage. It's $200, and if you can't go, I'll sell a kidney, but I just want you to go, okay? If you can, go. This is not about coming and going to a conference, and you're going to hear, here are the X, Ys, and Zs of great relationships. We are going to have a little few breakouts, but the main point is for you to get away from all this mess with your wife and love her really, really well and watch what happens. Wives, Encourage your husband to be a part of this. We're not making any money off of it. You can ask Josh. He's our CFO. We don't have any to make. It's $200. We're going to stay in one of the dopest hotels in Asheville. That's what the cool kids say nowadays. One of the nicest hotels that we've gotten a sweet discount because of someone who we love in our church who is over that. All your food except for Friday nights can be taken care of. And Friday night, we're going to go on a big date anyways and have fun in Nashville. Because you need someone to probably force you to step away from work and life for a day and go invest in your wife. Husbands, looking at you. Take the step. Be the leader. Do it. There's no excuse. In fact, we have one scholarship out there waiting for someone. So if you just absolutely cannot pay for it and you want to go, come talk to me. It's out there. Church, you cannot do this alone. We are always going to be better together. I love you. Let's pray. We hope you enjoyed today's message, that you feel so encouraged by who God is and by who he thinks and knows you are as well. If you have any questions about our ministry or our church, you can check us out at trailside.church, find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You can also download our app from the iTunes or Android store. Thank you so much and have a great day.